Let us pray. Almighty God, by whom alone kings reign and princes decree justice, and from whom alone comes all counsel, wisdom, and understanding, be thine unworthy servants here gathered together in thy name, do most humbly beseech you to send down thy heavenly wisdom from above to direct and guide us in all our consultations and grant that we having thy fear always before our eyes and laying aside all private interests, prejudices and partial affections, the result of all our counsels may be to the glory of thy blessed name, the maintenance of true religion and justice, the safety, honor, and happiness of the queen, the public will, peace and tranquility of St. Lucia, and the uniting and knitting together of the hearts of all persons and estates within the same. In true Christian love and charity, one towards another, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Good morning, Senators. Senators, I have received communication from Senator Minister of Health, Senator Joachim Henry, Leader of Opposition Business, and Senator Timothy Manga, that they are unable to be with us this morning. In particularly, Senator Henry, and Senator Manga are both out of state, out of state. Senators, I have also received correspondence from the Speaker of the House of Assembly, advising that the following bill was passed in the House of Assembly and forwarded to the Senate for its concurrence, the airport development. Statements by ministers. Leader of Government Business. Mr. President, in order to comply with international tax standards, St. Lucia has signed on a number of agreements and which facilitate the exchange of information. 
This ranges from automatic, automatic exchange to the exchange of information on requests to spontaneous exchange. To, en to ensure compliance with our international counterparts, Senusha has amended procedures and policies at various institutions, enacted new legislation, and has made several legislative amendments over the past few years. It must be noted, Mr. President, that the emphasis on compliance has become even more apparent in recent times as governments around the world seek to protect much needed tax revenue. In addition, Mr. President, failure to comply may result in lost funding, penalties, blacklisting, and other sanctions, and may invariably affect a nation's standing in the international arena. As a small island developing state which, pos which possesses limited resources, this nation has always endeavored and will continue to endeavor to be compliant with international standards. Notwithstanding, it should be noted that compliance comes at a cost. Not only does compliance require investment in, in software, training, and equipment, but it can also affect this nation's ability to attract much-needed foreign direct investment. The years 2015 and 2016 in particular, Mr. President, Senusha made several legislative amendments, all in an effort to improve this nation's standing in the international arena. In fact, Mr. President, Senusha was able to receive an upgrade from a rating of partially compliant to one of largely compliant last year from the Global Forum as a result, as a direct result of the procedural changes and amendments which were made with respect to tax matters. St. Lucia is currently compliant with the Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act, better known as FATCA, and has successfully reported twice under FATCA in 2016 and 2017. St. Lucia has facilitated the exchange of information on requests with various treaty partners and is working assiduously towards submitting the first report under the Common Reporting Standard, CRS, in, 20, in September 2018. Mr. President, as I mentioned previously, the exchange of information is quite dynamic. No sooner than a nation complies with one requirement, another requirement crops up its head. This was quite apparent this year when the Council of European Union, hereafter referred to as a council, represented by the Code of Conduct Group, hereafter referred to as COCC, COCJ, approached St. Lucia with the review of imposing a series of measures criteria that would require St. Lucia to make both policy and legislative amendments. The main aim of this group is to develop policies to combat what is considered as harmful tax practices and to eliminate money laundering, tax fraud, evasion, and avoidance. Through all independent screening process, the COCG singled out nations, including our own, which facilitated the information of, in, of entities and arrangements which were perceived as harmful regimes. The screening process reviewed jurisdictions based on three main criteria. One, tax transparency. Two, fair taxation. And three, the, the implementation of anti-base erosion profit sharing, better known as BEEPS measures. St. Lucia was asked to further explain the findings of the COCG and eventually, this nation was asked to commit to addressing the perceived deficiencies and to commit to signing onto the inclusive framework for base erosion and profit shifting, or at least commit to the minimum BIPs standards by 31st December 2018. 
Mr. President, this nation was given very little time to commit to making changes which could affect entire sectors within the economy. We, however, did commit, commit to conducting a review with the assistance of, of from the EU, get towards addressing the perceived deficiencies. On December 5th, 5th 2017, the Council released a list of non-cooperative jurisdictions for tax purposes. St. Lucia, along with 16 other nations, including Barbados, Grenada, and Trinidad and Tobago, was listed as a non-cooperative jurisdiction. We are now awaiting of official correspondence from the Council, which will outline the expectation of the EU as well as the next steps which St. Lucia needs to take in order to be delisted. The Council indicated that defensive measures, both of tax and non-tax nature, will be adopted to encourage compliance. These include the withholding of funding from certain EU organizations to increased monitoring, to flagging increased audit risks from countries dealing with non-cooperative jurisdictions, and the amendment of legislation to making investing in such nations unattractive. Mr. Speaker, Mr. President, St. Lucia is at a crossroads. This nation has to continue to remain competitive and, attract, uh, and attractive to foreign investors while simultaneously complying with globally ac acceptable tax standards. This is the direction that this government was heading towards and will continue to work towards as we endeavor to strike a healthy balance. We must aim to remain competitive, but we cannot and will not enter into, com into combat with our international counterparts. This government is committed to working with the EU to reach a mutually beneficial stance and a more harmonized tax system which fosters compliance while sim simultaneously growing the economy. We must conform but remain competitive and herein lies the challenge. Mr. President, St. Lucia has committed to engaging in open dialogue with the EU and other international groupings and will work relentlessly to resolve the issues currently before us as it relates to being blacklisted by the EU. Thank you, Mr. President. Minister for Home Affairs, Justice and, and National Security. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Good morning, members of the Senate. Good morning to all present. Um, Mr. President, I just want to speak about the, the crime symposium that was held at the Ministry of Infrastructure's conference room on the 24th of November 2017. I would like to, to thank, uh, take this opportunity to thank the large number of persons who responded positively to my invitation to attend the crime symposium held at the conference room of the Ministry of Infrastructure. I would like to apologize to some persons who were not able to get seats because of the overwhelming response of the public. Attendance was supposed to be by invitation, but other persons who heard of the symposium showed up, and as such, we could not refuse their participation. I know of a particular individual who criticized the venue um, because he did not find um, space. Um, he was also disappointed that the main issue highlighted in the letter of invitation, which was the high incidence of homicides, were not addressed. I listened to some of the talk show hosts criticizing the crime symposium, indicating that this was just another exercise in futility. 
and I was very disturbed by the comments. But I must say that they may have inadvertently hyped up the symposium, judging from the response. Taking into consideration that over the last few years, crime has been a major issue, and the response to the crime situation was dealt with in a similar fashion by both governments. There were the programs of Restore Peace in 1999 and Restore Confidence in 2010-2011. These were necessary initiatives taken at the time. I hasten to add that Restore Confidence worked, but the institutional response was lacking in a formal structure. What is occurring presently is the effect of the criticism leveled at the initiative by certain politicians for their own selfish reasons. Against that background, I felt that this was an opportune time to get the general public together, to get a feel of their sentiments in relation to the spiraling crime situation, and the way forward in developing policies to respond accordingly. I must indicate that previous consultations have been held and may have produced recommendations, but the reality is, Mr. President, that those reports cannot be readily accessible, and, I, and as such, I had to convene the symposium. In that regard, I want to thank Mr. Osbert Regis, who was kind enough to give me a copy of the CARICOM Crime and Security Strategy and its strategic goals. The difference in this symposium is that I made a commitment to the public that they will be kept abreast of everything that the government will be doing and that they will be active participants in the decisions arrived at. On the 4th of December, I informed my cabinet colleagues of the symposium. We did not go into detail because I did not have the notes of the rapporteur at the time. Just before coming this morning, I received the notes and will take it to cabinet on the 11th of December. I will also circulate to all groups and individuals who attended the symposium. My observation of the symposium was that particular emphasis was placed on the issues impacting the young people. I must say that I'm, I was very impressed with the performance of the President of the Youth Council. From the document presented to me by Mr. Regis, we are going to start off with two initiatives. One, taking the profit out of crime by attacking the assets of those persons who are known to be involved in crime. And secondly, we are going to be amending the Firearm Act to make the penalties more stringent. These two initiatives will be discussed later. Special mention must be made of the Leader of the Opposition, Mr. Philip J.P.I., and Senator Gibeon Ferdinand for their attendance and contributions. I believe that more of such instances where members of both political parties can put away the differences and come together on issues of national importance must be more prevalent. I want to thank Honorable Guy Joseph, the Acting Prime Minister. I want to thank all the groups which attended. I want to also thank the Minister for Infrastructure for allowing us the use of his facilities. To my hardworking members of the Ministry of Home Affairs, I say thank you. Uh, Mr. President, this is just a short um, indication as to what transpired, and we will be further enlightened as we go along. Thank you very much. Minister in the Ministry of Equity, Social Justice, Empowerment, Youth Development, Sports, Culture, and Local Government. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I just want to express my gratitude, Mr. President, um, to you and your office for the support you gave to facilitate my presence and that of my colleague, um, Senator from the opposition to attend the training program at Westminster in London. Um, it was indeed an eye-opener, I think, for both of us. And um, I hope that we can come back here and work with our teams, because we have select um, committee teams within the Senate. Um, we can come back here and try to impart some of the things um, that we've, you know, we understood or learned while, while on this mission. Um, but Mr. President, I also want to note the passing of two stalwarts in sports. Um, we had George, Melville, George Mello Alfred, um, who used to be an opening batsman for St. Lucia, um, a sports administrator extraordinaire, and um, worked a lot with young boxers in St. Lucia. He passed away, and we want to express our condolences 
um, and extend our condolences to his family. We also had um, Philippa, Philippa Charles of Marigo, another athlete who represented St. Lucia at the Commonwealth Games in Victoria in 1994. And of course, she passed away suddenly, and we want to extend our deepest sympathies as a Senate, as a government, um, and on behalf of the sporting fraternity in St. Lucia. And we also lost, in the last two months as well, we lost St. Lucia's first, or not St. Lucia, but Sufre's first carnival queen, Miss Unita Christine Jacques Williams um, of Sufre. She passed on, and we want to acknowledge the contribution that these people made you know, to our society um, in the various fields of endeavor. So these were just the comments on my chest this morning, and I wanted to express that. And thank you again for the contribution you made to my personal development in the last month. Senator Turner, if you like, please. Papers to be laid. Honorable Minister in the, Ministry of, in the Ministry of Finance and Leader of Government Business. Mr. President, I beg to, to lay the following papers standing in my name. Statutory instrument number 102 of 2017, St. Lucia National Housing Corporation, Doe Carmel Viewfort Vesting Order. Statutory instrument number 103 of 2017, Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court, Court Proceeding Fees, St. Lucia Rules. Statutory instrument number 104 of 2017, Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court, Non-Contagious Probate and Administration of Estates Rules. Statutory instrument number 105 of 2017, Automatic Exchange of Financial Account Information, Amendment of Schedule II Order. Statutory Instrument Number 107 of 2017, Automatic Exchange of Financial Account Information, Designation of Non-Reporting Financial Institution Order. Statutory Instrument Number 108 of 2017, Tourism Incentives, Joy Adventure and Coastal Cruise Company Limited order. Statutory instrument number 109 of 2017. Tourism incentives, summer sled, jet ski, rental, St. Lucia order. Statutory instrument number 110 of 2017. Tourism stimulus and investment, Bay Gardens Limited order. Statutory instrument number 111 of 2017, Finance Administration Act, Resolution of Parliament to Borrow for Capital Expenditure, St. Lucia Disaster Vulnerability Reduction Project. Statutory instrument number 112 of 2017, Finance Administration Act, Resolution of Parliament to Borrow from the Bank of St. Lucia Limited for capital expenditure for finance to finance the 2017-2018 budget. Statutory instrument number 113 of 2017, Finance Administration Act, resolution of parliament to borrow from First National Bank of St. Lucia Limited for capital expenditure to finance the 2017-2018 budget. 20, statutory instrument number 114, of 2017, value added tax resolution of parliament to approve draft value added tax amendment of schedule three order. Statutory in instrument number 115 of 2017, price control amendment number 17 order. Statutory instrument number 116 of 2017, excise tax amendment of schedule one number eight order. Statutory instrument number 117 of 2017, legal profession, eligibility, Andre Charles McKenzie order. Statutory instrument number 118 of 2017, legal profession, eligibility, Shonita, Akira, Jordan order. 
statutory, statutory instrument number 119 of 2017, automatic exchange of financial account information, designation of an excluded account order, statutory instrument number 120 of 2017, Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court Court Proceedings Fees St. Lucia Amendment Rules, statutory, statutory Instrument Number 121 of 2017, Value Added Tax Amendment of Schedule 3 Order. And that's it, Mr. President. Thank you. Bills, Honorable Leader of Government Business. Mr. President, I beg to move the first reading of a sh bill shortly entitled Airport Development. Airport Development. Honorable Leader of Government Business. Mr. President, I beg to move for the suspension of standing order number 492 to allow the bill to go through its remaining stages at this sitting. Honorable Senators, the question is that standing order number 49 to be suspended in order to allow the Honorable Leader of Government Business to proceed with the remaining stages of the bill at this sitting. I now put the question. As many as are of that opinion, say I. As many as are of a contrary opinion, say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Leave is granted. Honorable Leader of Government Business. Mr. President, I beg to move the second reading of the bill shortly entitled Airport Development. Airport Development. Mr. President, as you know very well, and the Senate, that the Senate met and made some very good and important contributions with regard to this bill that is before us this morning. I am not too sure how or uh, the extent to which further discussions will come out of this bill this morning. I have said a lot. The record is there to show. So I await for anyone who may have something to say on this bill. Thank you. Honorable Senators, the question is that the Airport Development Bill be read a second time. Senator Mauricio Thomas, Francis. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Regrettably, uh, I was not present for the last debate on this particular matter. And um, I think it's fitting for me to take the opportunity to add some of my own thoughts and add my contribution um, in that regard. The whole matter of the airport redevelopment has been on the cards for a very, very long time. If I recall, uh, as far back as almost 10 years ago, we've been discussing redevelopment of the airport. Sadly, Mr. President, a lot of political football has gone on as, it re as, as regards this important redevelopment thrust. And I must say that I am very happy that we are revisiting this thrust and I do hope, I do sincerely hope, as well as some other citizens which I've been speaking to concerning this particular matter, they also hope that we can bring this matter to fruition very, very quickly. Mr. President, the airport redevelopment is very, very critical. We have been positioning St. Lucia as a high-end tourism destination. So when we talk about inviting tourists who are prepared to spend as much as 1,500 US dollars to stay at Jade Mountain, 1,000 US dollars to stay at Anshasne and to stay at Sugar Beach and the like, 
We need to ensure that what I term the window of St. Lucia is given the deserving priority. Why do I say window, Mr. President? It is obvious. The first bit of St. Lucia, well, maybe I should say the second. The first aspect of St. Lucia that one sees from the air is the two pitons when one comes via airplane. And the second one is the airport. I have had a situation, I've experienced a situation where I felt very, very embarrassed, Mr. President, coming into Uranura Airport, and it was raining. I came in on American Airline. The airline was loaded with visitors coming into the country, and it was raining. Myself and all those visitors actually had to walk through the rain to come into the terminal building. I felt embarrassed, and I believe this is not deserving of the kind of profile that we intend to actually, you know, yes, yes, Madam Minister. <laughs> this is not the profile that we want to exhibit out there to the, to the world. We invest tremendous sums of money trying to get tourism on the upswing. We've made tremendous strides, but I believe we still have a long way to go, and redeveloping Iran Airport will be one of the areas that I believe will redound to some benefit to the country. Mr. Mr. President, I had a look at certain aspects of the bill, and I noted there that the developmental charge of 45 US relates to developmental funding which the government intends to seek, and repayments of such funding will come from the charge of 45 US per head. I was not at the previous meeting, perhaps the leader of government business can tell me uh, or explain for my benefit or the benefit of other persons who may not be aware what sort of, what is, what is the extent of the funding? Because if we arrive at a figure of 45 US per head, presumably we would have done an analysis to determine how much funding will be required to develop the airport. From my reading of the bill, it is suggested there that repayment of the debt, the developmental debt, will be generated solely from this source. So it would be useful if we understand the extent of the borrowing that we are talking about. Just to get into some specifics, in terms of section 10.1, under section 10.1, Subsection B and subsections B and C, titled Functions of Collector, provisions have been made for ring fencing of the revenue, and this is very, very heartening. It is very heartening, I'm comfortable with that. Under debt service, section 12.1, and I read. Subject to this section, the development charge is for the purpose of making payments for the debt service requirement of a debt arrangement to implement airport facility improvement projects. That section went further on the three to say where a debt arrangement is entered under subsection two, the authority shall set up a lockbox account into which money is collected from the development charge are transferred. So that's the sort of ring fencing I speak about and I'm very happy to see such a clause included in there. Mr. President, under annual report, section 21, subsection 1, it is noted there that not later than six months after the end of each financial year, the authority shall submit to the minister an annual report on the operations and activities of the fund. Section 2 states an annual report under section 1 must be accompanied by the auditor's report under section 20. And the third one says the minister shall lay an annual report, an auditor's report, submitted under subsection two in the parliament. Again, this is very important, um, but I just want to state here that we have witnessed that historically important reports such as these end up being very tardy. And by the time you receive the information and you do the analysis, it's so historic that it is really meaningless in a sense in terms of taking corrective actions where we have been found wanting, especially when we are speaking of areas of accountability and what have you. 
So we need to ensure that we add teeth to this section such that the reports can be tabled at the right time. Mr. President, these are the sort of the few observations that I have made. Once again, I just want to implore the government to hasten the process and get that development going. We have heard enough conversations about it, enough debates about it. We've seen enough political football about it. Let us make it happen because the country needs it. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Ferdinand. Thank you, Mr. President. I last stood in this honorable house and did make my contribution to the, the debate, but since the last sitting, there have been just a few developments that I thought would be important to note. And I think while we are in no way opposed to the idea of the, the country developing its infrastructure regarding uh, tourist arrivals, our ports, seaports, and airports, um, I believe that it is, it is important that we pay attention to certain areas um, of concern. It's not the first time, Mr. President, that I have stood to make a, a call or to perhaps be the voice of a group, a certain group of um, persons in this country. Thus far, who we have not really seen much attention being paid to. So while the airport development is very important, I am very concerned that to date we have not seen a similar effort being made to address some of the issues that confront other groups. I was happy to hear about the crime symposium. I attended, and I think it's a good move. And I expect that there will be some um, financing coming. Because every time you have consultations and you make decisions, it always um, results in some kind of expenditure, some finance. So I'm hoping that that will happen. Likewise, I know that from the discussion, we're looking at $400 million. And that is a huge investment. And if we are eager to go ahead and borrow that amount of money for that development, which I again emphasize is important, I'm still very concerned that we have not made similar efforts to address issues that are prevalent and do not require anything close to that type of um, investment. Mr. President, at the last sitting of the lower house, it was very good to see the Blind Welfare Association, well, the, not the Blind Welfare Association, well, they were represented, but the main group, the um, persons for and of, of with disabilities being represented. And I think in our interaction, they were very happy to be here. And I think um, I remembered reference made to a young child from Chazelle Secondary who was, who, was, who was entered school and is going to go through the conventional a mainstream school who is visually impaired. I would have liked to hear that while we're borrowing, or when we want to borrow 40, $400 million, that some effort is being made to help alleviate the cause of those groups, particularly um, in schools. I, I note that among the, the persons there, we had, there was a student, a former student of Miku Secondary we were able to get him a prosthetic leg. And it has made a big difference to his life. And so we, we continue to discuss and hear about implementation of the airport development tax to go with this um, airport development. And it has led to, I don't know if that's the reason, but we now have to pay attention to the fact that our country has been blacklisted, not on the gray list like um, Bermuda and the Cayman Islands and Switzerland, not on the um, watch list, but on the blacklist. And our leader of government business alluded to that earlier. That is a signal that we need to be very careful when we get into those types of 
um, projects and make sure that when we are going to borrow money that the revenue stream that we keep talking about is there. And so we need to see that as a signal. We should be on high alert. And the EU has signaled that the documents are there, the evidence is out there. And so if we are going to develop our ports, develop our airports, uh, we must ensure that we can justify the investment. And if we have decided to um, part with the PPP, which was the model that was there before, and go ahead and borrow it, I think we must be able to justify that very well and show that this is clearly the better way to do it. I think it is very important because there have been several arguments presented from other projects done through that approach worldwide that have shown that, yes, it may have its, you know, its concerns, but it is a viable option. Mr. President, since the last sitting, there are other developments that have taken place regarding the same issues that I debated, the issues of attention being paid to certain aspects of infrastructure, infrastructural development, and not enough to human resource development. And so I just want to continue with a couple of points along those same lines and say that perhaps we should also think of finding the money. We're looking at $400 million. It's not going to cost even a million dollars to do some of the things that need to be done to make a serious impact in our, in our human resource development, especially in education and sports. So Mr. President, we can find some money to repair Miku Secondary. Since that incident in September, the Form 3 wooden block has been demolished and it's just there. Nothing has happened. The students are still at the Miku Primary School, some of them. The teachers are still under the same conditions. We haven't heard anybody mention borrowing any money to address that. And that is still an issue. We, we, we should also consider what is going to happen in 2018 with CXC Online. I have not heard any efforts being made to procure any funds to make all of our computer labs ready for that in, in, inevitability. It is going to happen. I have not heard anything, Mr. President, to address a very serious issue that occurred between the last sitting and now. And I'm speaking of a rat infestation problem at the Forest Year Methodist Primary School last week. And that is a serious issue. The staff and students had to be, um, had to be sent home. That does not require $400 million, Mr. S Mr. President. And these things, we need to, we can avoid those things. And these things have a serious impact. The, uh, the independent senator mentioned the embarrassment of having to walk out of an airplane in the rain and so on. These issues can embarrass us as well. And it does not cost us $400 million to address. I also want to mention, Mr. President, that last week, but before I go to that, one more thing on education that I had mentioned the last time, and I want to reiterate. So right now, this Arthur Lewis Community College has one of its departments housed at the George Charles Secondary School. And the teacher, the, the, the teacher training department. And I think it would be good that we seek with some kind of urgency to see if we can remove that department from there and house it where it used to be so that the school can be used to you know, for other purposes. On to sports, Mr. President. We can do likewise. We have a situation last week, or we had a situation last week, where the inter-secondary school road race started and ended at the Darren Sami Cricket Grounds in Bosig. And one of my former uh, colleagues called me to express, you know, her, well, she was not concerned, she was very angry that the students came back and there's no water. Nowhere to, to, you know, you can't use the toilets and you start and complete an event in a, in a, in a facility where it, there's no water. It would not cost $400 million for us to take care of that, Mr. President. And that too can be embarrassing. In, in a, a couple of weeks, in fact, from next week, from December, I think it's December 14th to 17th, the seventh round of the West Indies um, Cricket Boards for the tournament will be hosted, one of the games will be hosted here. Um, Windward Islands, Volcanoes versus Jamaica Scorpions at the Bosejo Cricket Grounds, the Darren Sami Cricket Grounds. Have we taken care of that? Do we want to be embarrassed? 
And these, again, will not cost all that money. So I have no problems with any effort to make our ports more, you know, modern and better. I have no problems with that. But I have a difficulty that to date, and I have said it every time I have stood in this honorable house, that to date there is no apparent effort on the government's, you know, in, in, in this government to show that they have any commitment or any interest in addressing real issues that affect real people, our students, our athletes. I heard uh, my colleague, Senator, quite rightly pay some homage to two of our, our stalwarts who have passed on. Our Minister for National Security was one of the, 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 the batsmen who I didn't want to bowl to. Pretty good, pretty prolific, you know? Um, and I think that our athletes, our students, our teachers, our human resource, I think we need to pay a little more attention to them. I need to hear that we are going to, to have some kind of investment. So I have no difficulty with improving our ports, seaports, airports, or any port. But I have an issue when it comes to where the priority is. And why is it that we are so keen to go and borrow all that money when we could have borrowed a lot less that could have done to, that could have had a greater impact in certain areas. And so, Mr. President, this is basically my concern with the, with, with the, the, the situation as it stands. And I think it should signal to us that it is about time that we balance the, 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 the efforts a little more. And I did say the last time that I was hoping I would, re when we returned to this house, I would have heard at least one bill, one paper being laid to suggest that we are going to make some kind of effort in that regard. The last time I heard something, it was, I think, the Youth Empowerment Bill that we debated, which I supported. And I heard about the Crime Symposium, which was, ref which was refreshing. But I know the recommendations are with the, the, the Minister for National Security, and he has vowed to, to not let it um, pick up dust. But I would like to hear that there are similar efforts being made towards making investment in our St. Lucia's human resource. So, Mr. President, um, I am not against any effort to develop the airport, and I would support that. I, I have issues with the method that is being used to get the funds, but more importantly, my major concern is that we as a government, it's about time we begin to hear people from the um, disabilities, uh, uh, the disabilities group people in education, people in sports, people in healthcare, who are not making a profit with their service, but who are important to our national development, who help to ensure that we have a healthy, a healthy nation, a nation that is progressive, see some effort on this, by this government to invest in their best interest. I thank you, Mr. President. Senator Tena Filai, please. Turn off your mic, Senator. Senator Gideon. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, it was uh, more or less unfortunate that um, the last sitting of the House, I was um, absent. And um, today, I am here to share my thoughts on this airport bill and also to make some other points. When the last administration came up with the plan for the airport, I know that it was in public domain that um, it was brought to the public to decide as to what should be done. Should we continue with going and borrow, or should we go the route of getting someone to build, and after we get our airport We lost the elections, and um, this administration came in. And upon coming in, to me, 
what has happened is that they've just diffused what St. Lucian's agreed to. Because to come up with the PPP arrangement, it was brought to the public. There were consultations with stakeholders. And the decision was to go this route. But here we are. We have changed it. And we have decided to go on to borrow 150 million US dollars and um, to go on with the development of the airport. My question is, what is St. Lucian's or what are St. Lucian's saying on this matter? Did this administration take into consideration the ideas and the wishes of St. Lucian's when it came to this idea of dismissing the PPP and going over to borrow 150,000 or million US dollars? I'm just asking a question that I need answers to. This is another loan. It is another loan, and it is adding to what is already there for St. Lucia. My second point is we have a 35 US dollar tax added to the tickets. It is going to be placed in a lockbox. Yes. But my question is, after the airport has been redeveloped, and let's say the loan paid, what happens to this money? Is it going to be removed, or is it going to be continued? The tax. Is the tax going to be removed? Because it is placed there for a reason, and the reason is to build the airport. Okay? Ongoing development. So ongoing development. It, it, well, for me, in the, in the, in the um, thing, all it said was to build the airport. It is build the airport. Okay? You are the ones to deliver the dam right now. You are in power. You to deliver it. So you remove it if it's not fit. Simple. If it is not fit, you remove it. All right? And um, so if I, as a tourist, traveling, hotel, the, the airport has been built, and I still have a tax of $35 placed, and it is said is to build the airport. Don't I have a right to consider, to question, to ask why am I paying $35 for something that is already done? Why? I have a right to ask that. So if we are coming in, we have to be explicit. I have, I'm under the impression that this government, Mr. President, as far as I sit, I scrutinize, I look, I see that this government has very little respect and concern for St. Lucians as a whole. My colleague made mention of some of the issues that I also sharing. But even more seriously, we just recently had a second fire in Sufra Hospital. I listened, and um, I have heard to me, in my listening, I have heard no word on what is going to happen to Sufre Hospital. I didn't hear any report on the very first fire. All I heard was electrical, but I heard no 
proper report and the persons or solutions were placed back at the hospital. Mr. President. Leader of government business. Standing order 31, 37 one says that subject to the provisions of these standing orders, debate upon any motion, bill, or amendment shall, re shall be relevant to such motion, bill, or amendment, and a senator shall confine, a senator shall confine his observations to the subject under discussion. Mr. President, I think that the Honorable Senator is going beyond what this bill speaks of. Senator, I, Senator Leader of Government Business, I note your, 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 your point of order. I am I'm awaiting the good Senator to see in which exactly where he's going, but I understand, I understand that um, um, one may tailor his presentation in a way. Um, so I'm, I'm just hoping that he does not continue to, to, to stray away from the airport development, but he'll do it in such a way that he'll always remember what we're debating is the airport development. It was, Mr. President, it was just a warning. Well, that, that's, just to guide him accordingly. Thank you very much. Thank you and very just much. Just remind him of 37. Thank you very much, Senator. I need no warning from you, sir, when it comes to what I have to say. No warning. So, uh, Mr. President, I was saying that as far as I'm concerned, there is a lack of respect for St. Lucia. And while we are interested in the massive, big money projects, the little ones that concerned St. Lucians, to give them a better life, we tend to overlook it. We tend to say, well, we will come back to it. But I heard no statement, and I'm going to stand by my word, I heard no statement on the super hospital being burned. I heard no statement, apart from the callous throwing around that SLP was the one who did it and whatever. Evidence, hardcore facts, that is what we're looking at. And I think, Mr. President, that whilst, yes, let us look for ways and means to increase our tourism arrivals, yes. But in the final analysis, where do they come to? Who do they mingle with? And what is going to be the results? Build the airport, nice, give it a nice decor, nice. Tourists are going to come in, nice airport. But going through the country, passing on the highway, East Coast Highway, turning right as they go by Miko. What do they see? What do they see? And this is where school children, our future generation, that is where they are being housed, taught. So if we want, yes, it's not an issue, it's not a problem. But let us look at taking care of our in-house business. Let us look at what is significant, not only the big ones, but more so to the small ones. Because the tourists are going to interface with our citizens. They're going to interface with our citizens. And if you are putting me, or you are giving me, first and foremost, a wrong place where I could sit and learn, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? 
I'm a job out of school. And the very same Tories that comes to St. Lucia, they may be in trouble. They may be in trouble. So what I'm saying, it is significant that when we are doing one, let's look also, more importantly, at what remains in the country to be looked after. Let's look at it. That is what I'm saying. Let's look at it. So I need these to be answered. Was the St. Lucian public involved in the discussion? Was it just a situation where I came in and I decided, you know what, I'm not going this way. Because I am the Prime Minister, or because I am the ruling party, I can just say to myself, you know what, we are not going this way, we are going back to where we were. Take it to the people. Let's hear the voices of the people. Go on the streets and hear what the people are saying. We are just, what, you are just 17 members. Hear what the people are saying. And if we can get from them, yes. You know this PP thing? That was nonsense. Let's go. Go and borrow. Go on, borrow, build the airport, or redevelop the airport, and then you lost the, the following election. We don't care. Just I'm one person. I lost the election. I can just go and sit down somewhere and relax myself. I don't have to be in St. Lucia. My children don't have to be educated in St. Lucia. You understand? I can take my flight and go. And so I think it is disrespectful. It is disrespectful to just look at St. Lucia and just say to them, I'm going for a loan of 150 million US dollars to build the airport. When the former decision, there was island wide. People were involved, stakeholders were involved, business persons were involved in coming up with the decision. And secondly, I need to know at the end of or the completion of the airport, the $35 US, will it remain or is it going to be redirected, as you were saying, to something else with reference to the airport? Because if, as I said, I'm a tourist, that's the first thing I'm going to ask. Upon completion of the airport, will I still have to pay $35 development tax on my flight to St. Lucia? Mr. President, I just need to say one word of warning. And that is what came out the day before yesterday as it relates to St. Lucia and the EU. The leader of government business, yes, he attempted to make, give an explanation. But the bottom line is after all your discussion, your island is still on the list. You said you discussed. They discussed if you had discussions, you were making steps and so on. But your island still is on the list. Why? Why is it still there? It did not just come. You said you had discussions. But the EU is saying that you, as an island, you are reluctant. As an island, you're reluctant to go on with the changes that they recommended. You're reluctant to go on with the changes that they recommended. They are saying that you offer preferential tax. You offer preferential tax. You have a preferential tax regime. Is it a tax where only a certain set of persons have been taxed? Or is it a tax where you encourage persons to come in with all their monies and they get all things free? 
You exempt them from everything. They come in, so they leave the countries with their wealth of money. They don't pay tax. They avoid tax. They evade tax. They come to the country, to our country, and they build an empire. They build an empire, and then they said, okay, we are all right. So when to pay tax, what they say? I have investment in St. Lucia. I have this in St. Lucia. And what happens to the poor person? The poor person, the same way they said the former administration loaded the economy with tax. Poor persons, they have no fiscal space. No fiscal space, nothing to move. No, they can't move around. But it's our poor persons right now, the trickle down economics. It's not working. Fake. Trickle down economics. Fake. The poor man suffers. The poor man bears the grant. And you have the big millionaires, they come in and they ride. They ride free in our country. And we are the ones suffering. We are the ones paying every bit of tax. The woman tell me what? When they buy sugar, when they buy sugar, they, 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 there's what? What? What's that? What's that? The poor man buys it every day. The poor man buys it every day. And the rich man can't afford to buy it. They can buy it. So the little tax that you say, whatever, the poor man is the one suffering. The poor man. So I'm saying that we need to get off this list. We have up until 2018, September 2018, we need to get off the list. And we need to get off it in haste. And so, Mr. Speaker and Mr. President, I want, I have no problem with the airport development. I know that St. Lucia deserves a better airport. There's no doubt about that. And the debate over 16, 17 years as to how has gone far too long. But in coming up with this idea, let us look for what is better for St. Lucia. Let's look for what is better for St. Lucia. And if we can get what is better for St. Lucia, let's take it. And let's not look to get to squeeze St. Lucia and some persons, some, a few of them, you know, a few of them with the companies. Yes, St. Lucia, go and get that money and let me run. Let, give it to me, let me do it. And then they get rich and then they eat kick out the poor man continuously, I don't think it's fair. So I would like, first and foremost, to hear the voices of St. Lucians. Get them involved. Let me hear what they will say. And if they agree that we go out and borrow the 150 million vis-a-vis -vis what was there, no problem. We take it. We build our airport, we develop our airport, and we move on. But as far as I'm concerned, I have heard nothing about this $150 million loan going to the public domain. Go into um go and have some town hall meetings. Discuss with the people. Or the key stakeholders, the business people, hoteliers, whoever, have I with you, sit with them, discuss with them, and then come up with a decision. We we'll just come and sit in a cabinet and just say, you know what, today that's what we're doing, we're going with this. And because we are the government in power, we take it and we go. Only time will tell. Time will tell. Only time will tell. And I've always said that. Time will tell. You're in authority. You do as you please. But it can never be forever. There is a hand and there is an eye looking over us. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator, Minister in the Ministry of Equity, Social Justice, Empowerment, Youth Development, Sports, Culture, and Local Government. Thank you, Mr. President. You know, Mr. President, without a vision, a people perish. And as I listen to my colleague, Senator, across the table, 
I'm so happy that the people of St. Lucia made the decision that they made last, last year. Because this government that we are part of is a government with vision and understanding of the critical issues in this country. Well, not even 2020, it might be 2090 now. <laughs> so, and, and my, 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 my thoughts go out to the people of this country because they elected us. And they elected those of us, when I say elected, they elected our team, my team, which has experience what it is, you understand, to come into the Hiranura International Airport. You heard my colleague, Senator, the independent senator and the experiences that she herself has had. We all as St. Lucians have experienced it. So we don't need to go back to the people of St. Lucia for this. It's something that we've been living for years. We need to improve. And that's where we are headed. And that's why this government is wasting no time in making the decisions in the interests of the people of this country. We cannot sit by and wait for people without vision. Because if your previous administration had vision, Today, we would have had our airport spanking new and leading the rest of the OECS. We are here to begin that process of revitalizing that country, our country and leading. As youngsters, we grew up in St. Lucia knowing that our country was at the forefront of everything in the OECS countries. Today, we're running behind. We're running behind. So we have a responsibility to reposition our country, and that's where we're headed. Mr. President, I support the motion and hope my government can move speedily to implement this project. Thank you. Leader of government business. Thank you, Mr. President. <clears throat> Mr. President, I, as I said when I presented the bill, that I had no intentions of being or saying more on the bill because I had said so much um, the last time we met here. But you know, Mr. President, as the leader of government business, I have the responsibility to to react, to rebut to the contributions of members opposite and also the independent members. I have that responsibility and that's exactly what I will do. Mr. President, um, one of the biggest issues that we as a nation face is that of our debt. This government recognizes the, the level of debt and the the unsustainable level, that is, Mr. President. And if we don't do something speedily, we will end up in a, in a serious mess. Mr. President, as we currently speak, our debt level is $3.2 billion. That is equivalent to more than twice our national budget, which is like $1.4 billion. And in terms of its proportion to the level of economic activity, it is 67%. Our economy stands at $4.5 billion, our debt at 3.2. So we're in the region about 66, 68% debt to GDP. And when we look at the, the fiscal situation in St. Lucia, it's alarming. In terms of fiscal space, Mr. President, we have very little space to rigor, to move. And therefore, Mr. President, understanding the need for investing in, in private 
public sector, the public, the private investment sector. PIP is Mr. President. It's very important. We need to, we have no choice. We need to develop our roads and just our broad infrastructure. And as we are here this morning, we are speaking about the development of the airport. And we have agreed, Mr. President, that the airport needs to be, to be redeveloped. I think we have that common understanding agreement among ourselves. There is need to develop our airports. And the question is, Mr. President, where and how do we do it? How do we do it? Where do we get the money from? Where would you get the money? Obviously, Mr. President, we cannot rely on our recurrent revenue. We can't. Because this, the space we have, the discretionary space we have is very limited. Absorbed by what? The debt levels, absorbed by salaries and wages, pensions. Very little, Mr. President. Other sources of revenue, Mr. President? Grants. And we have seen over the years where our grant levels, or the grant levels have actually diminished. So what choice do we have, Mr. President? What are the choices do we have in terms of financing our infrastructure, the public infrastructure? What choices do we have, Mr. President? We have a choice of loans. We do. But Mr. President, as I said earlier, if we look at our debt situation, how do we manage it? How do we ensure that it does not become unsustainable? Therefore, Mr. President, we have to be creative in the way that we undertake these types of financing. So as a government, we have said that we will not, in as much as possible, I should say, increase our debt level without ensuring, Mr. President, that we have a new revenue stream. Not that we will not borrow, but we want to ensure that when we borrow, Mr. President, we are able to borrow from a new revenue stream. So, Mr. President, as we speak today, as we speak, in terms of our, the maturity of our debt profile structure, in less, Mr. President, in less than three years, 43% of our debt will, be, will, will, come, will, will mature. That amounts to about $1.4 billion in less than three years. In this year alone, Mr. President, less than one year, 27% of our debt stock will be due, will mature. This accounts to close to $900 million, close to a billion dollars. So I'm saying to you, Mr. President, the fiscal situation in St. Lucia is bad. And this is what we are trying as a government to correct. So the question of PPP comes up. Or oh, before I go there, Mr. President, in terms of the debt structure, 78% of our debt structure, Mr. President, our debt profile, It's between treasury bills and bonds. Treasury bills and bonds, 78%. In terms of our treasury bills, it's 52%. And we have almost exhausted the limit. Almost $500 million in treasury bills, Mr. President. So where do we have the space? So we have to be creative. So in terms of, Mr. President, financing for the project, for the development of the HIA, Euronora International Airport, we had to find a way. And that's the reason, Mr. President, we had to put in place the $35 US. Now, Mr. President, 
We understand also that in order to raise revenue for the country, it's important that we understand that we should not overburden the taxpayers of this country. Because when we came into government last year, we found an overburdened tax system. Overburdened. And as I explained in my last, the last sitting, Mr. President, I am not saying, or this government is not saying, that taxes are not important. Yes, taxes are important. But the speed in which you, you, the speed and the level of taxation is what you have to safeguard against. And I gave the scenario, I gave the analogy, Mr. President, of a tire. If you go, every, every tire has its limit in terms of how much, how much um, air you can give that tire. I think it, 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 it's in terms of what, RPIs? A PSI. PSIs? Yes. Some have 32 pounds, 33 pounds, some 45. And Mr. President, if you put too much air in that tire, expect the tire to burst. If you put too little, the efficiency of your the, the, the of your fuel will be compromised. So it means, Mr. President, you have to put and have a certain level of taxation in your country in order for it to be efficient. So what we found, we found a very inefficient tax system. And we'll be addressing that in our next, but in the budget coming, 2018, 2019. We'll be addressing it, Mr. President. We will. So we realize, Mr. President, that there's an, there's an opportunity for us to shift the tax burden from the local people, St. Lucians, households, businesses, shift it from them to our visitors, shift it from, from us to them. And that has worked, Mr. President, in many jurisdictions. In fact, Mr. President, when you go to territories, to regions where there are zero corporate taxes, zero income tax, zero sales tax, and the majority of the tax, the tax revenues come from what? The airport and import duties. Shifting again, Mr. President, burden of taxation away from our local people as much as possible to visitors. So we believe, Mr. President, this is an ideal time, ideal opportunity to raise revenue for the development of the Uranura International Airport. Now, Mr. President, I have heard lots about, lots of talk about PPPs and so on. Now, Mr. President, a key word in the PPP, the public-private partnership, <clears throat> I think the key word there, the key word here is partnership. Partnership. Why do you want a partner? Why does the government want or needs a partner in the development of its infrastructure? In this case, the Uranera International Airport. And why do we need a partner? One would need a partner in areas in which he or she is lacking. Or the other partner is stronger with certain features, certain factors. So why do we need a partner here? Before I go there, Mr. President, There is not a single model for PPPs. There's not a single one. There are various models for PPPs, various models. And there are various variants of individual models. So there's not a, a typical, there is not the 
I would say, it, it, it varies, Mr. President. There are variants. But the key for any partnership, Mr. President, public-private partnership, is to bring strengths together. And in most cases, Mr. President, in most cases, in most cases, a government will, will partner with a private entity. Most cases is because of revenue. Most cases. So the government needs the revenue of the private individual or institution. The private institution person provides that revenue, that needed money, to the government. The starting. And there are questions as to who builds that infrastructure. There are questions as to who operates or who should operate that infrastructure. And there are agreements between the two partners, the public, the government, and the private entity. But in this case, Mr. President, in this case, as a government, we believe that we are able to borrow the money. Now, if you are borrowing the money, the question is, what role does a private entity will play in this situation here? What's the role of the private entity here? We are able to raise our own revenues, Mr. President. Why do we need the private entity? In our situation, Mr. President, we may not have the expertise in building or designing the, uh, the airport. And therefore, we may rely on that entity to do just that. The question again, Mr. President, do we need that private entity to operate our, 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 our airport? And we as a government believe that we have the expertise in St. Lucia to operate the Euronera International Airport. So if that's the case, Mr. President, we are able to borrow our own money, borrow the, borrow, borrow the money, finance the money through the taxation, through taxes. We are not able, or we believe that the expertise is greater outside there to design and build the, house, to build the, the airport. Therefore, there's a partnership. But that partnership we as a government believe that we should be the one to operate the Hiranura International Airport. As opposed to, Mr. President, what was proposed by the former administration, we give them the money, they build the, and they operate, Mr. President, operate for 30 years, for 30 years, Mr. President, for 30 years, they will be operating the Euronera International Airport. And we believe, Mr. President, that's not the way to go. In fact, Mr. President, with good health and God's grace, Mr. President, I'll be 80 years, maybe 80 something years before we actually, <laughs> that, 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 that airport is transferred to St. Lucia. Individuals, my son is 10 years old, he'll be 40 years at a time. I have one who is 15, he'll be 55. Or 45, rather. Some of us who are inside of here might be in, the 90, in our 90s at a time. <laughs> Mr. President, we believe that the formation or the structure of the previous PPP is not the good one, is not the best one for St. Lucia. Not the best one. And Mr. President, we have seen various PPPs in St. Lucia. We have seen that. We have seen that. We have had various forms of PPPs, and the most familiar one, a common one, is the boat, where you build, you own, you lease, and you transfer. And that has happened a lot with our police stations, our police stations. The financiers build, they own it, and they lease it to the government, and then they transfer it back to the government. And I think this year alone, I think a few of them will be transferred to St. Lucia. And in my understanding, the, the communications 
infrastructure building was another bold agreement. And I think they have already tra been transferred to the government of St. Lucia. But in most cases, Mr. President, when you have these agreements, when you have these agreements, because the private, most times foreign entity, owns and operates, in most cases, Mr. President, when it's coming to the end of the transfer or the time to transfer to the government, most cases, the quality and maintenance is compromised. So imagine, Mr. President, we are through with, if we had to go to with the previous proposal, imagine everything is completed in the year 2020, in the year 2020. It means, Mr. President, the airport would have been, would be transferred to St. Lucia, the government of St. Lucia, in 2050, a 30-year-old airport is not the same airport as 2020 or 2025 or to even 2030. We may have to do the same thing we did before. It will not be the same airport. In fact, Mr. President, because Airports and aviation, the sector, they change so regularly and so frequently, Mr. President. We may have to have a different altogether airport by 2050. Altogether. And who knows, Mr. President, if we have someone who operates that airport, whether, whether or not that individual, that private entity, will comply and will change with change, Mr. President. But if we as a country, if we own and we operate our own airport, Mr. President, we will ensure that we remain relevant to the industry. Relevant to the industry. So, Mr. President, I am very happy the approach the government has taken, the model the government has undertaken to finance the redevelopment or development of the Euronura International Airport. I believe the best thing for St. Lucia and for St. Lucians. Now, Mr. President, I know the, the member for Denry, uh, the senator from Denry, the one who lost against um, Estefan. <laughs> oh, his name is Senator Gideon, right? Yeah. Gideon. Gideon, leader of government business. Senator Gideon. Very well. Yes, I, I was just trying to get his name. <laughs> Jerome Gideon. Yes. Senator G Sir, yes. But he was the one who lost against um, Estefan. Yes. Senator. You. Senators, senators. Leader of government business. I was standing order made clear by way, by the, through what means that you referred to members of either this house or the other house. Thank you, Mr. President. I did call him by the, thank you, Mr. President, for the, gui the guidance. Um, but I wasn't, was, Mr. President, I don't think that was name calling, was it? I don't think that was name calling. I was just saying that what happened last elections. Um, so, Mr. President, he was mentioning, he asked a question about um, whether or not we will maintain the 35 US dollars um, after the development of the airport? Um, the question is no. Oh, sorry, the question is yes, we have to. We must, because this 35 US dollars is part, will be part of the agreement for continued, continued development of the airport. Now, I know that when the last administration came in in 2011, they found an account with closely $54 million. $54 million. The tax was already in place. Adjustments were already made in the market in terms of tourists and uh, fairs and so on. 
And you know something, Mr. President? You know something? For a government to come in to find a, an, an already established tax or revenue stream, a revenue stream that didn't have any effect on the local people, none at all. There were no complaints about the, tech, that, about the tax, no complaints by our visitors, our, our tourists, none at all. And then, Mr. President, for the last administration to make that decision to repeal that tax or to zero that tax, that was a government without any vision. Any vision. And you know that, Mr. President? That tax was removed from the backs, I won't say backs, but it was removed and put on the backs of the people of St. Lucia. And that's why we had situations of increased water rates and increased um, the VATs. The VATs moved from zero, it was zero to 15. And, and you had just an avalanche of taxation in this country. We had a established revenue stream. And had we, Mr. President, had we maintained that tax, had we maintained that tax, the level of borrowing for the development of this airport now, Mr. President, would not have been at what it is right now. And who knows, Mr. President, we'd have had even We'd have had sufficient money to build that airport. But again, Mr. President, visionless and Kenonomics has failed the people of this country. Has failed miserably. Miserably. So, Mr. President, I just want to quickly respond to Senator Thomas says um, contribution. This uh, Senator Thomas Francis's um, contribution. I think she asked a particular question as to the level at which, or the how much money would be collecting from the taxation. Well, um, I would have preferred, Honorable Senator, questions like this. This one. Um, if we, are, if we are able to get it in advance, I would have gladly provided that answer to you because it needs some kind of analysis. But what I can assure you, Mr. Um, um, Senator, is that the, the 35 US dollars is viable. It's a viable tax in the sense that it is sufficient to deal with the development of the HIA. So I think, Mr. President, I have probably answered. Oh, one more thing, Mr. President. I, I must respond to the Honorable Senator Ferdinand's um, queries, questions. I know that he, has, he mentioned uh, what we have not done vis-a-vis -vis what we are attempting to do. But Mr. President, may I remind him that The reason why you have various economic systems is because of limited resources. One system believes that it's better for you to, to use the resources of a country one particular way and another, another regime, another system believes of things differently. Our resources are, are limited. That's the basics of economics. We have limited resources. And there are always competing ends. So one can easily come to the Senate or the, the lower house and say, you are doing this, why not do that? We cannot do this because we have to do this. 
And if you do this, it means that you are giving up what you can do here for here. So therefore, that's why, Mr. Prime, Mr. Mr. President, you must have priorities. And we believe that the HIA is a top priority for St. Lucia. Top priority. Because this government, Mr. Pre Mr. President, as part of its mandates, is to grow the economy, is to expand the economy. And we believe that infrastructural capacity building is very important to achieving this ideal goal of growth. Not saying to you, not saying to the senator that the concerns raised are not important. Yes, they are. But we believe that when we engage in such developments, infrastructural developments, that we can expand the economy. And with an expanded economy, we have the opportunity and the potential of increasing the tax revenues of the country. And if we are able to grow the economy, Mr. President, collect more revenues, it means that we are able to provide more goods and services for the people of this country. Again, priority. Priority. So, Mr. President, as I have said in the past, I believe that my government is on the right track. And come the new year, Mr. President, when, we'll, when we'll, we will unveil the 2018-19 budget, you'll understand, Mr. President, we are on a mission to grow this economy and to build a new, a new St. Lucia. Thank you, Mr. President. Honorable Senators, the question is that the Airport Development Bill be read a second time. I now put a question. As many as are of that opinion, see I? As many as are of the contrary opinion, see no? I think the eyes have it. The eyes have it. An act to provide for airport development and for related matters. Senators, it's a bill of about 20, of 24 clauses and two schedules. You would also have received proposed amendments from the lower house. Clause two. Interpretation. Clause two stands part of the bill. Clause three. Levying of development charge. Clause three stands part of the bill. Aye. Clause four. Duty of carrier. Clause four stands part of the bill. Aye. Clause five. Prohibition of boarding aircraft without payment of development charge. Clause five stands part of the bill. Aye. Clause six. Liability of and recovery from carrier. Clause six stands part of the bill. Clause 7. Power to withhold clearance of aircraft from unpaid development charge. Clause 7 stands part of the bill. Clause 8. Payment of development charge to collector. Clause 8 stands part of the bill. Clause 9. Designation of collector. Clause 9 stands part of the bill. Clause 10. Functions of collector. Clause 10 stands part of the bill. Clause 11. Payment of development charge to the authority. Clause 11 stands part of the bill. 
clause 12. Debt service. Clause 12 stands part of the bill. Clause 13. Establishment of Airport Facility Development Fund. Clause 13 stands part of the bill. Clause 14. Administration of the fund. Clause 14 stands part of the bill. Clause 15. Revenue of the fund. Clause 15 stands part of the bill. Clause 16. Expenses of the fund. Clause 16 stands part of the bill. Clause 17. Financial year of the fund. Clause 17 stands part of the bill. Clause 18. Budget and plan of action. Clause 18 stands part of the bill. Clause 19. Accounts. Clause 19 stands part of the bill. Clause 20. Audit. Clause 20 stands part of the bill. Clause 21. Annual report. Clause 21 stands part of the bill. Clause 22. Amendment of schedule. Clause 22 stands part of the bill. Clause 23. Regulations. Clause 23 stands part of the bill. Clause 24. Repeal. Clause 24 stands part of the bill. Schedule 1. Section 3.1, rate of tax. Schedule 1 stands part of the bill. Schedule 2. Section 3.2, travelers exempt from payment of development charge. Very well, Senators. That's where the, the proposed amendment. The amendment is to delete the full stop in subparagraph or in paragraph N and to include a semicolon and thereafter add a new paragraph O as you have received. Very well. Scheduled two as amended stands part of the bill. Senators, the quest clause one. Short title and commencement. Clause one stands part of the bill. Honorable Senators, the question is that the committee rises and the bill be reported. I now put a question. As many as are of that opinion, say I. As many as are of a contrary opinion, say no. I think the eyes have it. The eyes have it. Honorable Senators, I beg to report that the Airport Development Bill went through committee stage with amendments. I now put a question. Sorry. Honorable Leader of Government Business. Mr. President, I move that the report of the committee be adopted and the bill be read a third time and passed. Honorable Senators, the question is that the report of the committee be adopted and that the Airport Development Bill be read a third time and passed. I now put a question, as many as are of that opinion, see I, as many as are of a contrary opinion, see no. I think the eyes have it, the eyes have it. Be it enacted by the Queen's Most Excellent Majesty, banned with the advice and consent of the House of Assembly and the Senate of St. Lucia, and by the authority of the same as follows. This act may be cited as the Airport Development Act 2017. This act shall come into force on the first day of January, 2018. Senators, unless some unforeseen happening, this may very well be our last sitting for 2017. Let me take this opportunity to thank you, Senators, for your participation, your cooperation, your presentations in this Senate. It's been a long, productive year, in my opinion. I wish you, your family, and St. Lucia the very best for the remaining few days left 
in the year 2017. I will also take this opportunity to wish all of you and your family, and including that, our wider St. Lucia family, the very, a very Merry Christmas for us, a safe Christmas season. We know sometimes, yes, it is the season of goodwill, good cheer, happiness, understanding, love, sharing, and all. But sometimes, some elements do take the opportunity so I would like to keep us safe. So I pray the entire country a blessed, safe, love-filled Christmas season and a prosperous, productive 2018. I now open or oh, I throw it back to you, Senators, that you may want to join me in wishing fellow colleagues and wider St. Lucia or to speak to any topic that you may wish. <laughs> yes, of course, we've been the standing audience, so I, I am going to, I'm still going to be the, 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 the moderator of it all. Thank you very much, Senators. You may take the opportunity. Senator Adrian Oshie. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, as you mentioned, sir, this is our last sitting probably for 2017, and I would like to make a few comments as we close the year. Um, I'd like to begin, Mr. President, by acknowledging the untimely loss of a young St. Lucian professional active in economic development of our country, notably in tourism and in heritage tourism particularly. He was Nigel Mitchell. He was a good St. Lucian, and he served his country well as a public servant, as a private consultant, as a dedicated husband and father. I was unable to attend his funeral yesterday and feel very guilty about that, but I think it's incumbent upon me to offer him this small acknowledgement in this honorable house to note his passing and to offer our condolences to his immediate and extended family. We lost a good mind, a good man, so full of potential, and I think we shall miss him. Mr. President, I had the honor of representing St. Lucia at the Pal Americas Conference in Buenos Aires, as you're aware, Argentina, November 21st to 22nd. Um, the subject matter of the conference was Parliament's role in the process of open government. Um, I'm grateful for the opportunity. Let me express my thanks to your office for nominating me. And I think at this time of year, it is particularly fitting that we should pay a little attention to that, those matters of good governance and open government in particular, and the partnership that government is supposed to enjoy with the people. And that is to say how government, and more specifically parliament in the case of this conference, having regard for the broad principles of good governance, can assume a leading role in improving the quality of its relationship with the people of the country, civil society, civic institutions, and so forth. The convener of this conference was a, an institution called PAL America. It's an international partnership of countries who are devoted to improving processes of governance um, improving the importance of democratic traditions and for creating a forum in which parliamentarians like ourselves can meet and discuss across the hemisphere. Um, regarding the specific discussion at the conference, which I thought was very useful and I thought some of my colleagues here should hear about it, the conference considered actual living examples of countries who are trying to restore the quality of the democracy um, and the important thing is that very often it was parliamentarians on both sides um, recognizing that the problems of the country are shared and that yours today and mine tomorrow, we need to come together to solve some of the broader issues facing our democracies, both sides, in a bipartisan way, Mr. President, because both government and opposites are recognizing they need to be more successful in the pursuit of sustainable development. 
you know, growth today and then no growth tomorrow is not serving any of us. Or no growth today and no growth tomorrow is not serving any of us either. So the pursuit of sustainable development is something that concerns us all. And the sustainability of it from one regime to the next is important to the people who we are serving. Um, both sides, the conference noted that both sides, oppositions and governments, are recognizing that they need to address a growing skepticism among electorates and a growing distance from the process of democracy. And I think this is very important for us here in St. Lucia, where we have seen declining voter participation in the election process. We have seen increasing apathy, particularly among young people. We have seen frequent changes in government. We've spoken about that before in this honorable house. Every election for the last four, we've seen a change of regime, which suggests that nobody is happy. And election results, which also show declining margins, both between um, seats, um, the margin by which uh, an incumbent wins or loses, and also the margin in the popular vote, which is really in single digits and has been for quite a while. So the democratic process is not serving us particularly well, and we need to be objective in our assessment of it, no matter what side we are sitting on. We have heard in recent times much about the corporatization of government, and that the Honorable Prime Minister and his cabinet wish to function in the style of, or more in the style of a corporate board. And I think, Mr. President, this is all well and good, but let us never forget that the enterprise we are governing is the state of St. Lucia, the nation of St. Lucia. The shareholders of that enterprise are the people of St. Lucia. And the primary customers of that enterprise are the voters of St. Lucia. In that spirit, Mr. President, the conference noted the exemplary role of countries like Canada and host country Argentina for the lead role that they are playing in the process of open government. Canada, for example, has adopted a policy of open by default, which is to say documents, um, decisions, proceedings, minutes are made public as a matter of course. And the business of secrecy and confidentiality has largely been thrown to the wind. So except in matters of national security and other really sensitive um, areas, intelligence and so forth, all documents are placed on public websites, and other portals where they can be readily accessed. Nobody has to ask permission to see these things. This is the business of the people, and so it is readily available as a matter of course in real time. This pertains to contracts, tendering processes, um, even down to the agendas of individual ministers, who they meet and when and for how long and for how often. And this is to redress the impact of special interest groups and the fact that so many special interest groups have hijacked processes of government and have caused decisions to be made which are not in the best interest of the wider society. And yet these, these decisions are not sufficiently transparent that the people on the ground can understand why a certain thing is being done and by whom and for whom and who the ultimate beneficiaries are going to be. Um, there's much debate here and around the world about the relevance of democracy and its sister institution, capitalism, in the delivery of real tangible benefits to the people. In St. Lucia, I would like to suggest that 30, how many years after independence, we are still grappling with basic issues of survival, which we should not be. And it is because the model I believe that we are pursuing requires urgent renovation. And we're at the end of another year. I think we need to start 2018 with a mindset that suggests that we who sit in this house are serious about improving the flow of benefits to the people of this country. Not just rhetoric, not just chest beating. Um, we need to be serious about what we are promising, what we are delivering to the future generations of St. Lucia. We are failing them in too many respects, and we are not serious enough about fixing the things that need fixing. At the top of the list, education, Mr. President. We are condemning our children to slavery by not fixing the education system 
we are relegating them to the roles of the marginal and the poor forevermore for, for generations to come unless we fix the education system so that we can have higher paying jobs, better paying skills, a knowledge-based economy. More jobs at $2 an hour is of limited value to the people and even the government of St. Lucia, which needs to collect tax revenues from a healthy and robust economy. There is a new thinking, uh, Mr. President, that we must have a different approach to the business of lawmaking, which concerns this House, not just consultation before a bill is tabled, but deep and meaningful consultation in the process of drafting legislation. When the project is being contemplated, when the problem is being discussed, when solutions are being designed, we need to embrace and engage civil society so that we can have better solutions. We must not be afraid of sharing power with the people. They very often have more wisdom and intelligence than us, and the collective wisdom of St. Lucians is nothing to be sneezed at. People on the ground know what works, and more importantly, they know what doesn't work. So by the time you come with your highfalutin promises, you have fine pizza. It's a magic. All right? And they dismiss it. And then something that has a good chance or should have had a good chance of success is dismissed at the onset simply because we have not consulted in a real and meaningful way, not, not, um, not just for the sake of appearance after you've made up your mind, but at the very beginning, bring people in, embrace them, share. It's in your interest to do so and ours. Ultimately, we are talking about the co-creation of legislation, Mr. President. It's not something that we are accustomed to, but it is something that we have to think about. That it is, not, it is no longer the exclusive responsibility of elected officials to sit here and make up laws that are going to um, commit and bind and indebt people for the rest of their lives and, and, and future generations. We have to ask the people, do you want this? Do you want us to spend money on this? And even where we have wisdom and we have vision, we have to share that because you cannot lead people two miles in front. You have to lead them one or two steps ahead. We cannot leave the people behind, even as convinced as we might be about our own wisdom and, and intelligence and vision. So it is important, to, as we consider these issues, to recognize also that transparency is not an ideal anymore. Transparency is something that exists in real time. Social media is no friend as much as it is no foe. It can be both, but it will shine its light upon all of us. So the more we point du vent and offer information and intelligence to persons when we're in the process of making policy and making law, the more sustainable those laws and those policies are going to be. This is no longer the future, this is now. People are going to find out what happens in the darkness of cabinet and other places. They're going to find out. So it is better to involve them in a sustainable process of consultation than to have to account for your behavior or misbehavior after the fact. Um, so the light of technology will shine upon us all. Um, let us use this new access to information to enhance citizen participation, to ensure that there is proper public information out there. We don't have to be defending rumors all the time. We don't have to allow the, the, the media to be the sort of the, 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 the court of, of public prosecution. No, let us put the information out there and let us ensure that it is accurate. We cannot exclude people from their own development. Um, what, what people are telling us, and, and I think we all hear and we should all listen, is that as citizens, as voters, they are not prepared to accept a state apparatus which is not transparent, which they don't understand. How was a particular contract awarded? How was a job given? Why aren't public, um, public service positions advertised anymore? You just hear Joe get the job or Mary is the chosen one. No pun intended on the Mary, of course. Um, but how are these decisions made? It seems that too often public, public positions you just hear about who is there and who is not there anymore. These things need to be reopened. They need to be transparent. Let's get the best man or the best woman for the job, not just our political colleagues. Um, this is taxpayers' money that we're spending. This is time that we are losing. 
And when we put in competent people in positions, we are merely delaying the benefits that should be accruing to the people of St. Lucia. Let us choose the best people. Let us build a meritocracy. Let us leave political color out of the hiring process, please. Mr. Chairman, Mr. President, excuse me, on the business of transparency and good governance, I must call again, as I have written to you, sir, for the restoration of the Integrity Commission. All of us are outside the rules of compliance, having not filed. We can only say for so long that the Integrity Commission has not been composed and therefore there is no one to submit to, but that excuse is wearing a little bit thin in my conscience and I would like to be compliant with the Constitution and I'm going to ask publicly once again for the restoration of the Integrity Commission early in 2018. I would like that to be at the top of our agenda. I would also like to talk a little bit about the restoration of local government. Um, this business where all things shall come to you from Castries is not working. Those of you who are parliamentary representatives for your constituencies, you all know very well. Bertha is still waiting for the drain to be fixed. Isaac is hoping his road will be repaired. The wall that fell down during the heavy rains is still down. You all are busy ministers in Castries. You do not have time to go to Bouton and to Deyefon and to font les -Grains. You need local government to take care of these things elected local government where people choose their representatives and can cause themselves to be responsible for aspects of their life which are daily matters. There is no need for ministers to be deciding everything, give people responsibility for their own lives, for their own communities. The legislation is drafted. There have been several versions of it under both your regimes. Please bring it out into public light. Let it be debated early in 2018 and let us restore public government, um, local government as a fundamental principle of our democracy. Um, the big picture, Mr. President, and I will close shortly, is that we need to forge a new balance between representative democracy and participatory democracy. Right now, we have representative democracy. You elect me, I will do what I have to do, and I will tell you about it later. That is not necessarily what people want. People want to say, I elect you, and I will let you know what I would like you to do for me. Not later, but in real time. Because life today, is, thanks to technology, is real time. And this is why administrations are increasingly short-lived, because we're not asking people what they want. We're doing what we think we must do, and finding out at the end of five years that we were very wrong about what people wanted for themselves and for their children, for their country, for their community. It's not working, Mr. President. We have to change it, or else they will change us. It's very simple. That message has been sent time and time again. Um, so, um, Mr. President, in closing, I would just like to say that all of us, House, Senate, Party, Cabinet, elected, nominated members, we all are accountable to each other, we're accountable to the people of the country, to the voters, to the citizens, persons in our constituency. We are accountable to fellow St. Lucians. Let us not fail them, please. So the best of the season to us all and to our families and to our nation, a blessed, prosperous, a blessed Christmas and a prosperous 2018. God knows we need it. Thank you. Senator Ferdinand. Thank you, Mr. President. Very, um, very heartening thoughts shared by our colleague. I want to thank you, first of all, for um, providing us with very good guidance. And um, I could use leadership throughout the last, well, the entire year, 2017. I also want to thank my colleagues in the Senate for the manner in which we were able to conduct the business of the upper house. Um, I know it's the festive season ahead and there can be quite a few things that go right as well as things that go wrong. Um, but just before I say that, um, having listened to my colleague, I, I think he touched on two areas that have been kind of um, areas of repetition um, from the opposition and even from the government. 
Um, and I, I think I heard my colleague mention it earlier on, and that is participative, participative decision making, involving the public and the citizens in what is happening. And also the issue with the development of our, our human resource, our education. Um, and I was thinking, since we passed that bill, um, who are the 900 people who are going to be working at the airport? Are they going to be imported? Uh, is it going to be imported labor? Have we prepared our, 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 our populace for taking up those jobs and, and really um, being part of the labor force? Have we, are we doing that? Have we made sure that our, our Senator, our I don't want to stop you, but I hope you're not using the opportunity to no, reopen not, the bill. I'm not going there, but I'm saying <laughs> along the lines of participative decision making, I think these points have to be emphasized. We have to. Um, I also want to say that the, I want to reiterate and, and, and support the idea of the Integrity Commission being recommissioned. I think that is, that is, that is important. Um, the local government thing, I think from many years ago, I remember discussion being held to, to decide the role of local government. And at, at this point, I'm not sure that both governments in successive years or successive terms have really addressed this to ensure that this, this entity is functioning as it should. I think the members are generally being selected by whoever has won the election. And as, and as a product of the youth movement, um, youth and sports clubs and so on, that have made a very good contribution to our country, I think the process of elect, election, let people decide who the leaders in the communities are, who the people that are capable of delivering the community's agenda, become part of those, of those um, organizations, and not former politicians or friends and so on. I think that's a very important point that will help to develop our national, uh, our national agenda. And um, I like the open default idea that, that was raised. But I think in, 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 terms, in terms of that idea, it, for it to work, Mr. President, and I think St. Lucia can adopt that, um, we need to ensure that the people who are going to participate are going to be making meaningful contributions. People will be raising, anybody, any citizen can raise a question. But you want it to be something that is meaningful. You don't want it to be coming from a group of people who really don't know what they're saying, and it becomes ridiculous. So for us to do that, we have to raise the level of our education system. We have to produce people who when they speak or when they get involved in the decision making of the country, they are making substantial contributions. And so I, I think that that opportunity was, was very good for us to, to, to raise those issues. And um, of course, as we leave for the, for the end of this year, I want to, to wish St. Lucians and our constituents from the various parts of the country the very best for the season. I think we should find some time to spend with our families, our loved ones, I really would like to know that our Christmas is going to be safe. There's this tendency that in this season a lot of things go wrong and there's a spike in, you know, what we can call petty crimes and accidents and a lot of, a lot of things that we do not wish for. I'd want the Minister for National Security to, 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 be, to have, you know, a little less stress this Christmas, that he can he'll feel that he, has not, he doesn't have to be called to too many um, situations, um, as well as um, our other departments. The, the traffic department, for sure, I'm hoping that they will not have too many on their hands. And I think um, we probably want to be proactive in, in making sure that we anticipate some of the, the deviant behaviors and put measures in place to limit them. Um, I also want to say that we should all find some time to be generous and make someone smile. I think too often we operate in an environment of competition and, and rivalry. But it is, it is good that in the coming Christmas season, that from ourselves in the, in the upper house and of course other parliamentarians, from our colleagues, as well as in our communities. Let's find some time and, and reach out to at least one person and make their Christmas a little better, whether it's by a, a gift or by a kind word or a gesture. So I'm looking forward to the season and I wish all of us a safe, enjoyable, restful Christmas. And when we return in 2018, that we will continue the business of um, of, of the upper house on behalf of our people. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Belrose. I beg your pardon. Um, Mr. President, thanks for this opportunity. And as a very optimistic solution, I am indeed happy 
to see where we are at the end of this year. Um, I've heard my colleagues, and I think the, the, the points were well made. Um, but I think more importantly for me, as a solution who's been involved in organizations across the board, I am happy that the government of St. Lucia over the last year has done tremendous work to expand the opportunities for young people and citizens to get involved in community initiatives on the ground. Um, and I say this with particular reference to the um, Education for Democratic Citizenship, which we have introduced within the school's curriculum this year to ensure that every St. Lucian understand their role within the scheme of things. Because it's one thing for us to want people to be involved in what we're doing, but it's another thing for them to be prepared for the kind of engagement and the, and the, the, the criticism and the rebuttal that will come through with their involvement in it. So this program within the school system, I understood, has been doing fairly well, and we trust that it will continue um, over time. We take the points with respect to the continued improvements within the education system. We recognize that our human resource is the, is the number one resource, really, that you have. Because once your people are up, upgraded or up, up to speed, then it means that most things in the society can be adjusted um, properly. So we take that point and we'll continue to do the work that is required of us. From a local government standpoint, the agenda is set. We are working privilegedly to ensure that at some point we would have elections, but we continue to build capacity, build skills, give them various um, additional work areas um, to expand the capacity to be able to do the work that would be required of them. Leadership is very critical when you look at And we want when our leaders take on these positions that they do not just get filled with themselves only, but they recognize the value and privileged positions that they hold in terms of leading this country forward. So I want to thank you, Mr. President, for this opportunity, and I want to wish all the citizens of St. Lucia who have supported us over the last year, all the councils who have worked, all the members of the constituency councils who have worked with us to ensure that this year um, was the success that it is. As you know, in the next few weeks, uh, next week, in fact, is the Festival of Lights, which us ushers in the Christmas season, and we trust that St. Lucians will take advantage and be a part of the programs in and around the communities of St. Lucia um, as we usher in the Festival of Lights. And of course, we want to thank the Taiwanese ambassador for the tremendous contribution that Taiwan made to ensuring that this year's festival is going to be better than the rest of those, those we've had before. Thank you very much. Leader of Government Business, can you turn off your mic, please? Senator Mauritius Thomas. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Mr. President, I'd like to crave your indulgence at this particular juncture to um, wear a different hat in um, my capacity as chairperson of the National Awards Committee. The Order of St. Lucia, which was established under the Constitution, requires that once a year we invite nominations to honor worthy St. Lucians and other persons who have actually committed acts of bravery and meritorious service. Meritorious service, sorry. Mr. President, under that uh, mandate, we have actually launched the 2018 National Awards. We have embarked on a series of PR activities to ensure that we receive nominations. Because as we would be aware as a country, there are a lot of people who, on a daily basis, perform very significant acts. They go out, they do not seek recognition, they are our unsung heroes, and we need to be able to encourage them to continue to do the good work, inspire others, and also to encourage other persons to emulate the good work that they are doing. Um, we launched the 2018 um, National Awards in, on the 14th of November, 2017. Since then, we have embarked on a number of activities. We have been on GIS, uh, promoting you know, um, and inviting nominations. We have, we have been undertaking town hall meetings. In terms of town hall meetings, on the 19th of December, there is one that is going to happen down in Viewfort. 
and um, we are inviting persons to attend such that they can be sensitized. The, for the benefit of persons who are not aware, those awards are being bestowed on successful nominees at, during independent celebrations at the government house. And the categories of awards are the National Service Award, National Service Medal, the St. Lucia Cross, the St. Lucia Medal of Honor in two categories, Gold and Silver, the St. Lucia Medal of Merit, Gold and Silver, and the St. Lucia Lepito Medal, Gold, Silver, and Bronze. Mr. President, I would like to implore all St. Lucians to seek out and recognize persons who have done good deeds in this country. Particularly, I would like us to pay attention to the youth. I think our youth need inspiration. They need encouragement. And I believe we have youth out there who are doing tremendously good work, who are serving the country well. And I believe we need to take time out to recognize them such that they can continuously be inspired and they can inspire their peers as well. So far, we've received a number of nominations that we have started reviewing. However, we would like to encourage more persons to submit nominations to us. The deadline for that thrust is the 29th of December, 2017. So fellow senators, I would like to also implore you to submit nominations to the committee. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Mr. President, this is a time of year when we extend well wishes. And it's a time of year when we also reflect on what we've done well and what we could have done differently. I will speak from the perspective of where we are as a country, economically and socially. We all know it, but I think we need to reflect on that today and remind persons of where we are as a country such that we can prepare for a better 2018. Globally and regionally, we've had issues. When you talk about regional, look at the disasters that we experience as it relates to hurricanes and the implications it has had, not just for our sisters and brothers in these countries so impacted, but also some of them are our friends and family. In terms of the country, Mr. President, when we reflect, I don't believe that we can beat our chest and boast that 2017 was all that it could have been for us as a country. When you reflect on where we are, ease of doing business, unprecedented, 91%. It doesn't give us very good comfort. Mr. President, also, the crime situation, again, unprecedented. We are over 50 homicides in this country. It is disheartening. It is painful. It is sad. Every time I watch the news and I hear another homicide, it is very painful. And while I know our colleague here is doing his best to cope the situation and institute you know, mechanisms and institute programs to ensure that we reverse that trend, it is very worrisome. The whole issue of blacklisting, we heard our leader of government business talking about black, blacklisting today. Again, unprecedented. And our colleague minister has said, that St. Lucia used to be top in the OECS. I sat in a former role and I was very proud when I had to represent St. Lucia to my exec and to my shareholders to let them know that, hey, in the OECS, St. Lucia is the star on all fronts. St. Lucia was the star on all fronts. What has gone wrong to us? When you're talking about blacklisting, this is very, very serious. It has very serious implications for us de developmentally. It has very serious implications for us in terms of what sort of response we will get from G10 states. What sort of implications it has for us in terms of continuing to promote our CIP program. And of course, in general, the implications of attracting investors into the country. It is, it, it is very, very serious. I'm thinking of the banking sector, Mr. President. What are the implications for the banking sector at a time when we are talking about uh, de-risking? Hmm? It is serious. And then we have, on top of that, blacklisting. 
this would have implications for our country being able to access funding from funding agencies. Mr. President, I think we need to focus on how we're gonna fix those issues as a country and think of how we can do that in a bipartisan manner. I think too much politics. I think the country is, is, is too politically divided and once you're politically divided or divided for that matter, you cannot achieve the level of progress that is desired. So in 2018, we need to come together as a country. That is my plea, come together as a country, adopt a bipartisan approach, like I said, to dealing with those critical issues because at the end of the day, all of us will suffer. Every single one of us will suffer. And if anything, if we do not care, as individuals, we need to focus on our children and our grandchildren what kind of St. Lucia we want to leave for them. The trend we are on is definitely not the trend that we need to continue and we need to focus on fixing our country such that we can, as citizens, enjoy a, a, a better social and economic standard. I would also like to implore, because it's okay to just speak about the, 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 the ills, if you like, but I would like to implore all of us leaders to focus on re-engineering. I think our, our colleague has spoke, spoke in more granular terms. But in general terms, I say let us look at the process of re-engineering the country. Let us restructure, let us reform, let us try to reposition and come together to do that in a holistic way. We cannot continue to do it in a piecemeal approach and expect things to work. And we cannot continue to fight each other and expect at the end of the day we are going to achieve progress. So as we usher in the new year, I would like to extend best wishes to all of you, my colleagues, and best wishes to the entire St. Lucia. And let us look forward to making better things happen in the new year and beyond. I thank you, Mr. President. Leader of Government Business, before you take your position, Senators, just let me remind senators, I know that you've spoken um, of your representation of us, St. Lucia, and particularly of the parliament. Just let me remind senators who have that um, you have to submit your reports to us. Let me also say to you that um, I have been receiving feedbacks from these very various organizations, and we are um, you've been spoken highly of. So just let me say thank you for that. Senator Leader of Government Business. <laughs> Mr. President, um, I stand on my two feet. Mr. President, because not of my own, but it's always good to publicly thank the Almighty for his blessings through the year, his guidance, his protection, his sustenance. You know, Mr. President, when you come to the when we come to the end of the year it's a time to reflect on the journey that we we went through in the months and weeks bef before it's a time to reflect whether or not we have grown as a person as a nation it's a time to reflect as to whether or not we were able to surmount the obstacles, the trials that may have come our way. It's a time to reflect, Mr. President, on whether or not we have been able to forgive, even our forgive our enemies, to give those, forgive those who have trespassed against us a time to reflect whether or not we have truly forgiven. 
even ourselves, Mr. President, sometimes. So I want to publicly thank the good Lord for just his watch care over us as a people, as a nation. We were spared many hurricanes in the year 2017. And when we look at the devastation of Dominica and the other Caribbean islands, we have no choice, Mr. President, but to be thankful for the way he had actually, he has actually protected us from these natural disasters. Mr. President, I also want to thank this Senate, both the, well, the opposition, the, the independent side, and also my colleagues on the government side. I think we had a very good year of debates, meaningful, heated at times. But I think most, at the most, most part, it was very respectful. And I want to thank you, Mr. President, for the leadership that you, you undertook during these sittings. And I'm looking forward to next year's sitting of the Senate. The time of the budget, I know it's a very heated time. And I'm looking forward to the budget of 2018-2019. Mr. President, I also want to thank the, the members of my the members of cabinet. As a, as a body, we were given the responsibility to make decisions, policy decisions on behalf of the people of St. Lucia. And I must say to you, Mr. President, it is an honor to be able to serve at that level. There are tough decisions that we have made and I mean they have been tough decisions and we are and we have to make even even tougher decisions next year and the years ahead but mr. president I we believe that the the progress we have made as a country as a government is one to be applauded and admired Mr. President, because when we came in as a government, we decided to tackle the unemployment situation. As you know, and the nation may know, that we inherited an unemployment rate, overall unemployment rate of 25%, 24.8% rather, and a youth unemployment of close to 50%. And I'm pleased to report to the nation, Mr. President, that in the third quarter of 2017, the unemployment rate dropped to 16.8% compared to last year's third quarter. And we are expecting, Mr. President, and sorry, and the youth unemployment is now, now stands at 34%. So we have made progress, Mr. President, amidst the tough decisions that we have undertaken in the year 2017. Mr. President, also, we realize and we have, we have been given the report or the projected growth for 2017, and we're looking at a growth rate of close to 3%, 2.8, 2 2.7%. 2 this is remarkable, Mr. President, when you look at the, the anemic um, growth we had in St. Lucia in the last five years, or four and a half, five years, rather. So we are very hopeful, we are very, we are very um, hopeful that the year ahead would be even better for the people of this country. Mr. President, as a government, I also like to thank the opposition. Um, I believe that St. Lucia has a very good opposition. Very good opposition. Um, and I believe, Mr. President, they need to be as, remain as an opposition party. Because opposition is good for democracy, it keeps us in check. And I believe that, Mr. President, the more that the opposition put pressure on the government, the more we will shine. Because diamonds only shine under immense pressure. Mr. President, 
Apparently, the marches are working. So we expect even more marches in the year 2018. But jokes aside, Mr. President, I also want to lastly thank my family for their support through the year. They have been on my side, comforting me, supporting me, especially my dear wife, my lovely wife, who has been on my side day and night, and a supportive prayers, a comforting prayers. And I must tell the nation that she is a prayer warrior, and she will continue to pray not only for me, but for the people of St. Lucia. I want to thank also my other, pro my other prayer warriors, Mr. President. And I want to single out a gentleman, a pastor, Pastor Paul from Miku, who come to my office off and on and pray with me and pray for the people and the government of St. Lucia. I want to call, I want to thank Fast, um, Father Michel. I think he is the Grosley Parish for his words of counsel, words of comfort, words of encouragement and just his prayers in general. And just for those who would meet me on the wayside, in the streets, supermarkets, and encourage me and say to me that I'm praying for you. Mr. President, we as a, as a people, we must keep praying for this country. We must keep praying for the people of this country. We must be praying, keep praying for the government of this country. Because Mr. President, I believe, I believe that the devil is very active in this country, extremely active. And I'm calling upon churches, individuals to cease from praying because we believe that will I said desist from, do not desist from praying, right? Keep praying, because we believe, Mr. President, that with prayer, all things are possible. So as a Senate, as a, as a leader of government business in the Senate, I want to extend my, my, um, my best wishes to the people of St. Lucia. Let's hope and pray that the year 2018 will be a better year for St. Lucia compared to the years ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Senator Francis. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I, I didn't really want to speak but um, I think I'm, I'm forced to, to say a few words. Um, having listened to Senator Oje, I think he was all encompassing. And, and, and I, I, th I thought that we were going to end on that note, the note of inclusion, the note of, of, of being a government. And when we talk about government, not just the ruling party, but the opposition, and start the, the process of persons looking at St. Lucia as being um, the reason why we are in Parliament. And I'm very happy that he, he made that, that statement. And that was one of the reasons why I decided when Mr. Philip J. Pierre, the leader of the opposition, made that um, suggestion that I have the symposium, I really accepted because I think that crime is everybody's business. And um, it doesn't matter from who the, the the suggestion comes from that we must accept and work upon that. I think I want to wish you the very best, Mr. President, and the members of the Senate, and maybe the, and also the lower house and the cabinet. But I want to make special mention of persons who during the festive season um, are not as fortunate as us, that we are at home enjoying ourselves with our loved ones and being able to party. And I speak specifically of our police officers who are actually on duty when we are uh, enjoying ourselves. Our nurses, our doctors, 
uh, prison officers, our uh, fire officers who have to respond all during that festive season. And I think we need to pay special homage to, to those individuals who put their lives at risk and in danger year in, year out for the benefit of our St. Lucians. So I just want to make a special plea on their behalf to tell them that we are going to keep them in our prayers and we hope that they have a, a safe and um, incident-free um, festive season and that the new year brings um, bigger and more enlightened vigor on all of our parts to work in the benefit of all St. Lucians. Thank you. Senator Gideon. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, well, on behalf of um, myself, I don't um, say it openly, I don't um, celebrate Christmas. However, whoever does, whoever does, I would like them to do it in the, um, a godly spirit, a godly atmosphere. Um, the drinking, the excessive drinking, excessive eating, Put it on a side and um, be induced in the presence of God. Focus on God. You know, instead of eating and drinking, take it on going on a fast and pray for the betterment of our country. Pray for the sustenance of life and thank God because He is the provider. He is the one who carries us through. Even. Most persons do not want to recognize that, but God is the one who carries us through, and we need at every occasion that we get to give him thanks and praise and honor him for that. Um, I want to also wish the Senate all the best. Members of the Senate, enjoy your season. Put God first. And always remember that you are not alone. As my colleague said, help someone to enjoy the season. I will be praying for a blessed year that I'm going to see the end of the year by his grace and that I'm going to be here with all those who will be here to continue with the business of the country. Um, I want to thank you in particular, Mr. President, for your able support, your guidance, in the Senate, and also be very thankful to your staff and you for allowing me the opportunity to travel to attend um, the parliamentary session in England. I must say it was an eye-opener, and um, in my report, you're going to see the reason why it's an eye-opener, and I do wish so much that some of what I learned that St. Lucia's parliament would adopt so that we would become a more effective parliament to be more open, you know, especially there's one that has struck me and I need to make mention of it, that civilians can bring in questions into the house, place it in a box, it's shuffle, and at the certain time, whoever dips, and these questions have been answered by the particular minister or the line minister to which the question refers. And this, I was very much taken aback by it to see that citizens are also involved in the governance of the country. And I would so like, that's why I kept preaching that we have to involve the St. Lucians. We have to involve our people in what we do as a government. We are just there. They are the ones who put us. And we need to go out and get the ideas. They also, as um, our senator said, they have ideas and they would like to see it manifest. And um, it would be a very good thing that if St. Lucia's Parliament would at some point adopt, that persons from the civilians can come in, write the question, put it in a box, and there's a point in time where the questions will be answered or discussed or whatever. You know, and also looking forward to the unity between both government and opposition side, where leaders of the opposition or, government or opposition members head certain committees, they take charge of certain committees for the betterment of the country. And where, again, we have in government 
when there are debates in Parliament that even persons on the government side would stand and oppose government policies and plans. They would stand and they would oppose it, yet still they are government ministers. You know? And so I, 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 live, I, I live to see the day where these kinds of things will take place in our parliament so that persons can see if it is not good, it is not good. So I just don't come in and, and be a rubber stamp and I vote and I'm, I know inside, deep within me, that I'm against it. But because of me being on the ruling side, I just said, yeah, and they allow it to go. And I deep down within, consciously, I know that I do not support it. You know? So I enjoyed my, 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 my week, the parliamentary session, the, the, the parliamentary, I enjoyed it. It was very, very much enlightening for me. And um, in due time, I only learn I have to submit a report. This I will do and hand it to you. I, I, what, what's the deadline, um, yeah, may I ask? If there's a deadline, you know, so, so I, I, I can't, okay? But generally, I want to, to thank each and every one of us and also the supporting staff of, of Parliament. I want to say thank you for your support and your assistance and I hope that everyone enjoys and going through the end of the year and we see at the next Senate sitting. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Leader of Government Business. Mr. President, before I adjourn this sitting, I just want to just, just one mission I had. Come next year, God's willing, January 17th, I'll be turning 50 years old. And I am just trying, I want to invite the members of the Senate as part of my celebration. Um, the Sunday before my birthday, I want to take a walk up Mont Jimmy. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> you have me on that one? Okay. I have done, I have done this t twice and it's just an amazing, we'll take, amazing we'll take, journey. We'll take photographs of it. So, <laughs> and I want to extend the, the, the invitation to the opposition, the lower house opposition also. Um, I think it'll be a very good journey up Mount Jimmy. And uh, so that's my invitation as, uh, as part of my 50th anniversary. And also the staff also, the staff of the, of the parliament. So, Mr. President, I move that the Senate stand adjourned, stand Senators, we must also remember that um, our, our sitting is being broadcast, and um, all the, we start, thank the staff of the Parliament, but we didn't thank the staff of the NTN, and um, let's say thank you to them for the work that they've done throughout the year, and we look forward to seeing them in 2018. Senators, the question is that this house do stand the June sign a die. I now put a question. As many as are of that opinion, see I, as many as of the contrary opinions, you know, I think the eyes have it, the eyes have it. This house is adjourned. All right.